Billions and billions in spending and nary a specific program cut or belt tightening promise in sight. That's what voters have heard from the three major parties over the past few weeks. It's a far cry from what some more prudent voters might want to hear about debt, deficit and good fiscal housekeeping. What do the economically minded make of it all? Well, let's ask. In Kingston, Ontario, Don Drummond. He's the Stauffer Dunning Fellow in Global Public Policy and Adjunct Professor at the School of Policy Studies at Queen's University. And here in our studio, Rosalie Wanch, Policy Analyst for the C.D. Howe Institute. And Rosalie, nice to have you back on the program. Don Drummond, you too as well from Kingston. I want to just start by reading something that the former Parliamentary Budget Officer, Kevin Page, uh, as quoted in the Globe and Mail, it is difficult to make the case that any of the platforms, any of the platforms, are fiscally responsible or are grounded in a prudent economic strategy. I want to get feedback from both of you on that. Don Drummond, agree or disagree? I love the statement, just take out difficult to make the case. You can't make the case. <laughs> so it's not even, it's an, it's, a, it's an absolute zero as far as you're concerned. I don't care how hard you try. New math, old math, discovery <laughs> math, it doesn't add up. <laughs> Rosalie, your view? I would say I'm, uh, I have to agree with Don that basically the, all the platforms don't look like they have good underlying economic principles in terms of fiscal sustainability. And really, I haven't seen an argument that convinces me that any one of them does. So I'd say I agree with Don on that one. Don, let's uh, humor me for a second and drift off into political science away from fiscal science for just a second here. Uh, given what's at stake, why do you think that none of the parties, in your view, has put forward any f fiscal plan that, in your view, resembles reality? Well, unfortunately, this is a wave we're seeing around the world, and it tends to be the longer-run history of fiscal policy. So it's why people like myself who are involved in fiscal policy will never be unemployed for a long time. Because even when governments do claw themselves out of fiscal difficulty, they seem to go head first right back into it. Um, the United States did this. Their infamous tax reform is basically just a joke. It's a, adding a huge amount to their deficit. They didn't do a proper job. Italy, which is teetered on the verge of bankruptcy, is now talking about going into larger deficits. So we're seeing that around the country. Uh, to their credit, the Liberal governments actually did quite a few positive things on the fiscal front, starting from their deepest of their troubles in 2011, and depending on the, on the accounting issue, came close to balancing the budget, or actually did balance the budget, but despite all that, decided, you know, the way to win the voters' favor is to promise them a whole bunch of things, whether it's spending or tax relief, as opposed to, we'll give you financial security from running a responsible fiscal platform. Okay, so both of you have said you don't like any of the fiscal underpinnings of any of the plans, but Rosalie, having looked at all the major parties, would you say there is one that you think is a little closer to fiscal discipline than the others? Uh, I would say that without um, having much in the way of understanding how any of the parties is going to actually fund their promises, other than the NDP having a plan to tax the rich, which... I mean, you can do that, but there's, there's a limit there, and it does have implications for growth and entrepreneurship and some other aspects of, that can dampen growth that we, you know, that could be a worry. But at the end of the day, they, they do uh, have some details about how they're going to potentially fund some of their promises. Um, however, at the end of the day, none of them with a sustainable platform and with deficits all around Really, I think that I would like to see from one of them some, some sort of commitment to actually uh, finding this revenue somewhere or reallocating program spending from other places. As it stands, I don't see that any of them actually have um, answered the question. And just to uh, riff off of Don's point a little bit, I would say, depending on the accounting disagreement, it's a rather large accounting disagreement of you know, multi-billions of dollars. So it's $20 billion over three years, I think, that the Auditor General and the current government of Ontario disagree. Exactly. So, I mean, depending on what side of the argument you land on that, you could say that they are close to balance, or you could say they're very, very far from it. Right. So I would say that really none of the parties have come very close to it. Uh, I appreciate, Don, that's your position as well. But if you, if you had to look at the four main parties' platforms, is there one that you think at least gets closer to the kind of fiscal discipline, paying for programs, et cetera, that I know you care about? Well, from the overall fiscal perspective, the Liberal plan and the NDP plan are very similar. The measures within it are, are 
are stiffer in, in some respect, but basically they envision on the government's accounting basis running deficits of five to six billion dollars a year if you adopt the accounting that the Auditor General recommends. And that, by the way, the Auditor General is right. Whoever comes into power after June 7th will have to shift the accounting. Those deficits are 11, 12 and a billion dollars a year. I'm not going to make a big distinction between an 11 and 12. The conservatives one's got a lot of blanks in it. So one thing that's really intriguing in the so-called plan that they did finally release, there's no mention of it, of this infamous 4% or $6 billion a year cut in spending, which I don't think is sincere at any rate. You can't cut $6 billion and not affect any services and not affect any jobs. It wouldn't even make any sense to try to go about that. So even if they did get that $6 billion, their plan is at least as high deficits. And without that, their deficits under the conservative plan, kind of ironically, I say ironically, because they're the only party really talking about fiscal discipline, but actually the plan they put forward may actually have the highest deficits of the three. Rosalie, what's your view on the Tory plan such as it is? It is not a fully costed plan as the others are, but it's something. Whether or not that 4% in efficiencies can be found is definitely questionable and there would need to be some details as to where that's going to come from because it can't just come from staff or it can't just come from program spending because it's that is a very significant cut and it would definitely uh, end up hurting public services depending on where it comes from and event you can't cut staff forever there you do need people to actually work for the government and deliver programs and so the, and as well, they've made program commitments. So that, in a way, is actually a growth in government. So if we're finding these efficiencies, but growing government at the same time, I uh, am a little skeptical about the savings that you would find there. Well, let me pick up on that with Don, because the, the Conservatives have promised on significant tax cuts over the course of what presumably is a four-year term, should they win a majority government. They have also off, offered to ramp up spending quite significantly in some other areas as well. Can you do both simultaneously without blowing a hole in the deficit? Oh, clearly you can't. We're now, now we're not talking about policy. That's just a question about math. And no, you can't do that mathically. Uh, one of the things I really dread hearing is on June 8th, whoever wins will say, now we're in power, we've looked at the books and they're a lot worse than the previous government led us to believe, and we're going to have to change our plans. And, and why I dread hearing that is because there's no basis for anybody to say that. Whether you like the Liberals' budget in March, it was all there. There's over 300 pages of details of it. You can't say you're surprised by the accounting issue with the Auditor General. The Auditor General's laid it out very clearly. The Financial Accountability Officer's laid it out. The C.D. Howe Institute has laid it out very quickly. All of the platforms should be based on the correct accounting right now. And we know what the pressure's on. I'll throw in another one. I think the longer run economic growth rate for Ontario is more likely to be about one and a half percent. All the parties are using a growth rate around two percent. So there's a big hole in the plan right there before you do anything. So we're not going to grow our way out of this deficit either, is what you're saying? Absolutely not. Interestingly enough, with all their health plan initiatives and all the billion dollars, not one of them has mentioned that as soon as they come into power, they're going to get the arbitration award for the doctors, which is one of the biggest bills they face. I have no idea what that's going to be, but that could take up any of the new money they have for health right there. No one's even acknowledged that. Well, it's, I mean, it's probably $800 million to a $1 billion, right? That's a fair assessment? Well, and... and in terms of a fiscal hit, it's relative to what they have implicitly based in their plan. And, of course, I have no idea what any of the parties have implicitly based in their plan and their expectation for that award. Mm -hmm. Rosalie, let's see if we can just sort of understand what happens with the debt. Meaning every year, the finance minister in Ontario goes to the markets, borrows a lot of money to pay for the promises that he or she will make going forward. And we're at about $320 billion and counting right now of money that needs to be paid back. What happens, interest rates are very low right now, what happens if interest rates go up? Does that automatically mean that the amount of money we have to pay, the interest on that debt that we have, does that also go up? It will be maybe not immediate, but over time, absolutely. As interest rates are rising, as they have been, the cost of just carrying the debt that we have without adding to it will increase. And at you know, 12 billion a year, it's a bigger, expenditure than everything except for, I believe, education and health care. So Let's just understand that. We, we are paying 12, I think it's 12 and a half actually, 12 and a half billion dollars every year just in servicing the debt, interest on the debt. Exactly. Okay. So, I mean, if we were, if we're going to add to that debt, then we're 
essentially borrowing from the future. And so our interest already costs more than quite a few areas of programming. And if they are going to continue to add programming and we're adding to the debt, then you know we're, we're simply adding to debt, adding to interest to add to programs. And so it's really, at the end of the day, we're adding on top of adding in not the right direction. Hmm. Don, let me just, I, I really want to make sure that we're clear on this. If, for example, the government of Ontario goes to the markets and says, I need $6 billion to pay for all the promises that we're making this year. I, I want to borrow the money at, let's say, 1.5%. Do they not then, therefore, get that 1.5% interest rate for the next, I mean, can they not lock that in for 25 years or so? Well, they can borrow long term, but Ontario does already pay a premium. And if we look, we actually have an unprecedented situation where the credit rating in Quebec is actually now better than Ontario, even though the debt burden is higher in Quebec, because the credit rating agencies like the direction Quebec is going, which is in the direction of fiscal discipline, and they're very worried. So you do actually have, end up having to pay a premium on it. Another way of looking at that that I think Ontarians can relate to because everybody just finished off paying their taxes at the end of April, for every dollar you pay in taxes in, in Ontario, eight cents of that gets skimmed off to pay interest on the public debt. So you ask yourself, what do you want from your Ontario government? Will it be health and education and safe streets and police services and fire services? Well, you're working with a 92 cent deck. Eight cents of it is just getting burned to pay for something that somebody, probably somebody else consumed in the past. And that number will go up automatically in its own as interest rates go up. And so less and less of the money is gonna be available to pay for what people want. Rosalie, what other factors would you say are contributing to the precarity of the situation right now in terms of all of these financial numbers we're talking about? Well, I would say that really uh, we're at a pretty good position economically. We've had growth for quite a long time and there's just not a good economic argument for adding stimulus spending at the moment just because really I think that as Don said, we're already skimming off eight cents on every dollar that we pay in taxes. And so there's, and part of the, uh, part of the province's fiscal situation is the debt to GDP ratio. And so the province has some control over debt, but it doesn't necessarily control GDP. So if there were say external market conditions, say a trade war, perhaps. A trade war or how about or, an aging population? Or an aging population that will potentially dampen GDP growth or could we could potentially enter a recession, then our debt to GDP looks significantly less good than it does right now. And also that affects the province's ability to borrow and, and the interest rate that it would get. So I think that just the uncertainty of the climate, the economic climate in which we are in at the moment, also you know, has, is a strong argument for fiscal prudence because I think we should really be saving any, any stimulus spending for a rainy day. Essentially, you know, you could, to put it into the analogy of a household, say you get, you know, you've got your budget for the month and you can choose to spend all of that money and then also spend a couple hundred dollars extra on your credit card. And you can do that for quite a long time, but after a few years, if, you know, your car breaks down, then your credit card's maxed out and you don't have any money to pay for something when you need it. So they have uh, reckoning comes eventually. Eventually, and I think that we, we need to be looking at yeah. that day as potentially coming sooner rather than later. Well, let me follow up with Don on that. You know, the, the Great Recession, as, as it's been called, started uh, 10 years ago this year, or actually a little bit longer. Um, that rainy day, that next rainy day that governments ought to be planning for right now, Don, what, do you, what, do your, um, what does your experience tell you about how far away that next recession is? Well, I think all we can say is there will be one. There always has been one. There always will be one. I don't know when it's going to be. The scary thing is the step function on this <clears throat> debt ratio that we've been talking about. So go back to what you just said, the financial crises of 10 years ago. The net debt GDP ratio in Ontario at that time was 26%. Today it's 37 under these platforms that people are kicking around using the proper accounting, it'll go to 42%. You're getting my drift here, it's mm -hmm. going up and up. And that's when the economy has been growing now for seven years at a reasonably brisk pace. So it normally should come back towards this 26% and instead it's, it's going up. 
And I think another reference point, I think we would all agree that Ontario, as well as much of Canada, was on the precipice of an outright fiscal crisis in the mid-1990s. The debt ratio in Ontario then was 32%. So we're, we're going to talking about being 10 percentage points above what everybody agreed was a crisis just a couple of decades ago. Well, in which case, let's talk about what some of the solutions are. And Rosalie, I know that, I mean, you gave me a chart before we went on the air here. Uh, nobody wants to pay more taxes. That's just the simple fact of life. But the reality is, if, for example, the harmonized sales tax were to be kicked up one point, what would that do to the bottom line of the province of Ontario? Well, uh, just a bit of a back of the envelope estimate puts it, you know, at about five to six billion dollars. And so if we were all willing to pay one more point on GST and or the HST, then that would cover some of that deficit. But really to uh, cover what the deficits that we're looking at under the proper accounting methods, we're looking at two to three percent before we even get these new programs that are associated with all the platforms. So I think uh, as we already have some of the higher consumption tax rates, it's something that Ontario voters, I think, should be aware of. And I would actually like to see the parties, half or voters insist on parties connecting their promises to how they're going to fund them. Because at the end of the day, the, as we've said, the debt, there's a limit. We can't just keep adding on to it. And then, so if voters were more aware of the tax burden and what, you know, they're aware of the dollars out of their pocket that are going towards these programs, then maybe they would uh, be a little bit choosier as to what they, they actually wanted. And it would hold the, hold the parties to account. Don, in terms of what actually works best for the economy, meaning what promotes economic growth, what has less of a likelihood of having jobs um, Un, the word that popped into my head was uncreated. That's not the word I'm looking for. But whatever, whatever would dampen down job creation. Is it better, if you want to reduce the size of that deficit, is it better to increase the HST by a point, or is it better to go out and find, um, oh, I don't know, 4% savings uh, in government programs the way Doug Ford's talking about? Well, I would, I, I, if, until you mentioned the Doug Ford thing, because I don't think that's a genuine effort. That There's no detail. I have no idea what they intend to do. And as I said, in that 28-page document that they released, that does not appear. So that may actually not be part of the platform anymore. I, I don't know about that. But I would rather look at the expense. Here's the way I look at it. Since 2011, spending in Ontario government has increased just a little bit over 2.5% a year. Let's call it 2.5% a year. And that's gone down and everybody's recounting of it. That was a brief, very painful period of austerity necessary to deal with the fiscal excesses at the 2011 mark. I don't look at it that way at all. That is what the future looks like. If I'm right that the Ontario economy is only going to grow about 1.5%, and given that it needs to not just balance its budget but run surpluses to bring down debt, the future is something like 2.5% spending growth. And I get it if I was a politician. That doesn't sound like a lot of fun. Because not only have you got to keep the spending modest at 2.5%, you can't do what they did starting in 2011, like st starve the capital budgets on, on the, on the health care front. You actually have to roll up your sleeves and do the hard reforms to make people get the right services and the right outcomes from it at an efficient delivery. And that doesn't really interest a lot of politicians. It's better just to say from their perspective, we're going to spend billions. You can't do that. You actually have to go in and reform health and education and everything else to make sure they run more efficiently. And yeah, that's probably going to affect some services, but hopefully to improve them. Well, okay, but having said that, Don, go back to your time as Deputy Minister of Finance. If you had recommended to whatever finance minister you worked for at the time and said, you know, if you raise the HST by one point, we can realize another five to six billion dollars in revenue, would that be injurious to the economy to do that? Well, let's put it this way. If you had to go to the tax side, that would be the way to go. Um, I would say that or an environment-related tax. Uh, but that wouldn't be my first line. If I was doing the briefing, I would have that off to the side and say, I am going to make you stay here a long, long period of time, and we're going to exhaust what we can do on the expenditure side before we go to that tax book. But when we do go to the tax book, yes, the HST would be on uh, the head of the list. Gotcha. 
Let's talk for a second here, Rosalie, about the Ring of Fire. Politicians for 10 years have been saying the Ring of Fire is going to be our budgetary salvation because there's apparently $60 billion of stuff in the ground there that if we can actually get to it, mine it, sell it, uh, we're going to be fine. Is that accurate? Well, I would say they've been saying it for quite a long time. And yes, resources in the ground are worth something, but they're only worth something if you can sell them. And so we've been trying to develop that for quite some time. And also to actually get those resources out of the ground required, is still going to require some spending. You have to invest to be able to actually be able to profit. And since there are a number of, uh, let's say, hurdles that are, should be there where you, have, you, know, you need to consult with the local indigenous populations, there is regulatory and environmental concerns. And really, I just think that we shouldn't count our chickens before they hatch. And saying, well, we're just going to take the resources and sell those, that's, that's just a way to sort of pass the buck to say, oh, look, we've got this big pile of money over here that we, we're just going to use that. Mm -hmm. But if that were, in fact, the case, then maybe it would have already been part of the fiscal plan up to this point. And I'd say that resources in the ground shouldn't be counted as an, as an asset until we can actually figure out what to do with them. Gotcha. Let's, uh, we've got a few minutes left here. I want to touch on a couple of more things. Um, Don, let me read something that Jack Mintz, the economist from uh, Calgary, uh, had in the Financial Post the other day. He said, one way to deal with that debt burden is through faster economic growth. But Ontario faces a larger growth challenge now that it's lost the advantage it once had in competing with nearby American states for investment. Regulatory and tax reforms in the U.S. are luring capital, people, and profits from Ontario. If he's right, if Jack Mintz is right, Don, what should we do about that? Well, we know what Jack Mintz would say, we should be lowering the corporate tax burden, and the opposite of what the NDP did. I think we could have a reasonable debate about that. We certainly don't want to create a disadvantage, and that's exactly what the NDP platform would do, particularly given the trade vulnerabilities that are going on right now. So we did have a major corporate tax advantage over the United States, although we were in about the middle of the pack compared to other developed countries. Now, at absolutely best, we're fairly equal with the United States. We're a smaller jurisdiction, everything else equal, we would probably want to have an advantage. So that's why if you ask me what will be on the list for the tax options, the revenue new options, I certainly wouldn't have the corporate side on that. That would have to be uh, more on the HST or the environmental tax side. But on the environmental tax side, I would emphasize not as a source of revenue, but simply to change the mix of revenue. Rosalie, if we could do one significant thing to encourage more economic growth in the province of Ontario, thereby presumably bringing in more tax revenue and being able to chip away at that debt, what would you say it should be? One thing. Well, I think one thing that we shouldn't do is, uh, as Don said, is increase corporate taxes because that's simply a, damp a damper on business. But I think really one, one thing that would um, allay some concerns and may not actually be within provincial control is, is the, the U.S. and our trade uh, NAFTA as, a, as an agreement. And really it's not so much um, in terms of growth, but in terms of uncertainty and business confidence. I think that, you know, if people are confident that they can make money and that business will succeed or that their tax rates are going to stay relatively stable or their energy prices are relatively stable, then they're more likely to make investments. And really, we the economy grows through producing more things, having more people employed and more people consuming. So it's really, at the end of the day, business and business starts, which have been declining in Canada for about 30 years. I really think that that is an area that we need to look at as an area of concern is what, what can we do to encourage entrepreneurship as well as once we get entrepreneurs starting their businesses, what can we do to get them to scale and get them to actually, you know, become large employers all to compete on, on the global stage? All on the to-do list of the next Premier of Ontario. Uh, Don Drummond, economist at Queen's University, we thank you for being there for us on the line from Kingston, Ontario. Rosalie Wanch, policy analyst at the C.D. Howe Incident. C.D. Howe Institute, not incident. There we go. Thanks for your being here as well. Thanks for having me. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. 
helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.